Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you, choir. Let's have a word of prayer together. Lord, thank you. How good it is to gather in the house of the Lord today. How good it is to be part of your congregation and see the things you're doing. Lord, it's been a week. And you saw us through the storm, Lord. You walked with us through these days. I know our friends up north make fun of us because it's such a big deal. But Lord, it is a big deal to us. And you take care of us even through that. So Lord, today we're thankful. Thankful for so many that have made today possible. Lord, we are especially thankful for those chosen few who gladly went out on cold days and removed snow that we'd have a place to park. Lord, thank you for them. Bless their hearts and their lives. Thank you for their love that makes a day like this possible. And Lord, we also know that there are others in our congregation who aren't here with us right now. Some might be watching us at home. Some just simply can't. A storm still rages in their life. There's still the after effects. Lord, we pray for them. Pray that they might experience relief and healing and, yes, Lord, joy. Lord, especially, just because of the way our worship team led us today, I'm thinking about our brother Jeff Cruz. Lord, you know him. You, you know his heart and his love for you. And you know the very difficult storm of illness that he's suffered these past weeks. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in his life. Thank you for the strength he's receiving. Thank you for the healing that's going on and that will continue. Lord, we just bring him and so many others in our congregation before you. And yes, Lord, if we could be selfish, we would even bring ourselves to that place. For Lord, we need your healing. Lord, might we understand today we need your touch. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, turn with me to the book of Mark. Or if you have your scripture journal, take out your book of Mark. And turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 21 today. We're not going to be reading our whole passage because it's rather long and, and I want you to be able to do that. I encourage you to go home and just make this your homework assignment. The first, uh, I don't know, several verses of this all the way through verse 39 are a great picture for us of what Mark is trying to tell us. You know, a lot can happen in a day. A lot can take place in 24 hours. Sometimes it is just an ordinary every day, other day, but sometimes a lot gets packed into that time. And such is the case of what uh, Mark is telling us here in the life of Jesus. It's the first time Mark is really describing in detail what Jesus does. He's the Messiah, he is the Christ, the Son of, the God, Son of God, so what is it that he does? What's his daily work like? What's his agenda like? What are the kind of things that he's going to be about? What are the marks of the ministry of Jesus? Well, these first several verses, and I'm just going to kind of summarize them, encourage you to go back and look over them, really detail some of the things that Mark is going to point out to us over and over again throughout the gospel. Jesus preached. Jesus was about defining the kingdom. He was about defining and letting people know. And in our passage today, it talks about him preaching and teaching in the synagogue and that he preached with authority, not like one of the scribes. He wasn't depending upon other sources. He was speaking the truth that he, the Son of God, knew. He spoke and he taught and preached with authority. And then because of that, Mark wants us to know just how big of an authority he is. And we have a scene there in the next little bit of when uh, uh, Jesus is going to exercise a demon, an unclean spirit. And when everything is all said and done, through that spiritual battle, we see the victory of Jesus. His authority is even greater than the demonic forces out there in the world. Mark moves on a little bit farther, and he gives us an instance of healing a sick person. It was there in the city of Capernaum, kind of northwest part of the, uh, the Galilean region, the, around the Sea of Galilee, and it was there that Peter was from. Uh, we believe it. his mother-in-law lived there, and his mother-in-law was sick. And so Jesus goes ahead and gets involved in the family, and he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and she rises up, and then she begins to serve them. 
I think it's rather interesting that the lady was on her sickbed one moment and then she's serving her guest. I'm not sure what's there, but it's something there that to uh, consider and to ask a question of. Jesus is about healing and then Jesus is about prayer. It tells us in verse 35 that after all the things that were going on there in Capernaum, on this Sabbath day, he was teaching in the synagogue, exercised a demon, got rid of a demon out of a man's life. He healed another dear lady. And then Jesus got up early and he went away to pray. Went to a quiet place, a desolate place. Kind of makes me ask the question, if Jesus, the Son of God, had the need to pray to his heavenly Father, where does that leave me? And so Jesus goes ahead and he has that moment. His disciples come to him and say, Jesus, they're looking for you. Some good things have been going on. And Jesus goes ahead and then teaches his disciples. He instructs them about what's getting ready to happen. Things that are insights just for the inner circle. These five things are things we're going to see replicated over and over and over again in the Gospel of Mark as he shares with us and helps us understand just a little bit better about what it is to be able to follow Jesus and what it is to be about his ministry but you know what today i want us to focus more specifically on another passage on the passage that kind of comes at the end of this it's in it uh, begins in verse 40 it's in mark chapter 1 verse 40 and it's an instance that is kind of taken out it's not necessarily part of that day in capernaum that jesus was in it, it doesn't necessarily follow a chronology with that mark kind of introduces it like and by the way here's another story here's another time here's another example of what jesus did it is a healing moment it is a moment where where jesus touches a life where jesus makes a difference in a life but it is a significant moment and it's one that well it's one that Mark wants us to be able to understand. Let's go ahead and look in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40. Would you stand with me? Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Thank you, may be seated. It's a moment. It's a moment that is so significant. There have been times throughout my ministry I've had the privilege of being able to stand up here on this stage or another stage. And there's a young couple before me, a bride and a groom. And everybody else is being able to watch and see what's going on. But the three of us worship together for that moment. We listen to what the Lord says. They share their promises, their vows before their, the Lord. They, they give symbols, rings, and, and other, other opportunities for, for their relationship, their undying love to be seen. And then comes the moment, the privilege, the honor, if you will. When is a minister of the gospel, duly licensed in the state of Oklahoma, I get to say, I now pronounce you. And something happens in that moment. Two walked into the building. One walks out. I don't understand the miracle. I don't understand everything about it. All I know is what Scripture teaches us. A moment the two become one. It's that moment, that, that, that instant when something changes that Mark wants us to be able to see here right now. 
He wants us to understand, first of all, as we begin this thing, where there's something about newness that's going to take place, about a brokenness that now becomes wholeness, about a a wretched person that now has hope and promise. He wants us to be able to see this moment. And he begins by letting us know about a man in a deplorable condition. A deplorable condition. You see, this man was a leper, he tells us there in verse 40. He was a leper that uh, uh, suffered from this awful disease. Some tell us that probably the the diseases back then of of skin conditions and infections and, and those kind of things were all kind of lumped together under the term leprosy. What we understand about leprosy today, the real, uh, the, the awful thing about leprosy is it destroys nerve endings. That, that the, the, the disease itself doesn't cause uh, the, the awful effects that we might associate with, with the disease, but rather the disease simply means you can't feel. Your hands, your feet are numb. And the significant thing about that is, and the destruction that happens is, that if you are walking along and, and the pebble gets into your shoe, it doesn't take you long to figure that out, right? It doesn't take you but a minute to say, whoa, something's good. And you stop, you take off your shoe, and you thump it out, and out comes this huge boulder that is really the size of, you know, a tiny little thing. But you, you felt that, and you had to get rid of it. But imagine if you couldn't feel the pain. Imagine if you couldn't feel the hurt and you kept walking on that boulder, that little pebble, if you kept walking on that irritation, before too long it wouldn't be just an irritation, it would become a wound. And if something wasn't done, that wound would get infected. And if something wasn't done, eventually that infection would ravage the body and ravage the individual. That is the disease of leprosy. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the greatest gift we have is pain that lets us know something is wrong? That's worthy of thought, folks. Nonetheless, this man suffered. And because back then they didn't have any of the kind of medical uh, opportunities we'd have today, they knew that if such an infection as leprosy was let loose within the camp, the camp itself would be devastated. The infection, they didn't even know about germs or all those other kind of th- viruses and all that stuff. All they knew was that if it was not held in check, it would be deadly for everyone. And so they did what God commanded. Really, the only response, if you had leprosy, you were now unclean. And you could not be part of the camp. You were exiled, you were ostracized to the other part, to outside the camp. And you had to live in that kind of isolation and that kind of deplorable condition. You were alone. You were malnourished. You were constantly in need. To have leprosy that day was horrible, horrible indeed. The unclean were kept outside the camp. I think one of our challenges, one of our uh, opportunities as we are are studying the Gospel of Mark and certainly any narrative portion of Scripture is if we're not careful, we're just going to think, well, isn't that a nice story? Isn't that a nice narrative? Isn't that just something to be able to listen to? And that's good. And it is. It's good to learn the stories of Jesus. But I wonder if Mark isn't trying to communicate something that Jesus wanted us to hear about the gospel itself. That maybe the healing is not simply a way to show God at work, but rather to point to us in our own deplorable condition. To point out that maybe we have more in common with this leper than we might like to admit. Maybe there is something of the unclean within us. And maybe if that person sitting next to you on the pew knew 
what was going on. You would find yourself on the outside, no longer welcome. Maybe you're here today and you're listening and there's something of the depravity of your own soul right now that is a secret that is well kept. And you don't want the rest of the camp to ever find out about it because it means you're outside, unclean. I would encourage you when we read these stories of healings and encounters with Jesus, we don't simply make it about salvation, about coming to Jesus and gaining eternity and trusting in his name. Certainly it, it has that, and certainly that lesson is there. But I wonder if there's not something there for us now, not just in the sweet by and by, but in the today. Maybe when we look at this leper in his deplorable condition, maybe we see just a little bit of ourselves staring back. And if we can admit that, if, if, if we can come to that point and at least allow that as a possibility, the story gets really, really good then. Because the next thing Mark points out to us, after he shows us this deplorable person, he shows us our Lord and his shocking response. We see him as Jesus comes to this moment and something goes on. You know the rules of the camp. You know that if it's unclean, it's outside the camp. And if you come in contact with the unclean, the unclean now pollutes you. And you now become unclean, fit for nothing but being outside the camp. Unclean is to be avoided. Unclean is to be set apart. Unclean means you don't touch it. In technical terms, it's called a code 2319. It's the idea that once something that is unacceptable comes and touches our lives, we too take on that character. We too take on that unclean. Uncleanliness wins against whatever it is that we are. And so anyone who would touch a leper would be nothing better than a leper themselves. And in the midst of that culture, in the midst of that picture, do you hear it? In verse 41, Jesus has compassion on him and reaches out his hand and touches him. Do you hear the gasp of the people around him? Do you hear their muffled horror Oh my goodness, what has happened now? Jesus, is he now unclean? But the thing that we want to be able to understand and that we want to be able to see is to ask the question, why did Jesus touch him? I mean, after all, this is Jesus. This is the master. This is the son of God. Did he have to touch him to heal the leper? Of course not. He could have said, waved his arms in Messiah fashion and said, you are now clean. He could have done that. And the leper would have been clean. But he'd still be on the outside. He'd still be isolated. The reality of his own cleanliness would make no difference because by everybody else's reckoning, he was still leprous, unclean. But the master touched him. And Jesus, in that simple touch, communicated to everybody else, but most importantly, to that man, you are. Jesus did not need a priest to proclaim the man's cleanliness. That's part of the Mosaic law. That's for the camp. That's for the whole community. Jesus goes ahead and tells him, go ahead and take care of that. But Jesus had already pronounced him clean. He touched him. 
You see, our problem is we consider this spiritual battle like an arm wrestling contest. The unclean sets up. The clean of Jesus grasps the hand. And the struggle goes on. Is the unclean so unclean that even the cleanliness of Jesus doesn't stand a chance? Does it push against what Jesus is bringing? And does Jesus eventually come back and kind of come back and this struggle goes back and forth because the unclean is so unclean? How sad a picture that is and how false that picture is. Because whatever I bring in my uncleanliness, when touched by the hand of God, no contest. And I just about broke my arm right there. No contest. He's the Son of God. The pure, holy, virgin-born, divine Son of God. And when He touches us, that touch pushes every unclean out of the way. And His touch penetrates our very soul. The unclean becomes clean at the touch of Jesus. You say amen to that right now. Jesus touched. And the cleanliness of Jesus won. So I'd offer to you today that picture, that promise. The truth that I think is there for us to be learning today. It's not just a nice miracle story that points how powerful Jesus was, how sensational Jesus was but a story that points to the truth that Jesus still touches us today and takes the deplorable and makes it clean. In one sense of the word, Jesus touched him and the man's vocabulary changed. He was no longer a leper. Jesus touches you. What vocabulary is going to change? How you describe yourself, the unclean thing that is somehow a defining moment for you. When Jesus touches you, realize, friend, that vocabulary is no longer accurate. It is no longer defining. It is no longer attached to you. That word, like an ugly word on a blackboard, is now erased. And you stand clean, brand new, in the sight of God. This shocking response of Jesus. The unclean becomes clean. But there's one other thing about this story that I really want us to hear today and really I believe is kind of the heartbeat of what we want to learn. Because we're going to see and hear this man's unbridled testimony. As we read in the scripture, it's uh, the, the last couple of verses of our passage, 44 and 45. We read that Jesus got stern with him. Remember, just a little bit ago, he had compassion, pity on him, and touched him. But now Jesus puts on the preacher voice, you know? Jesus looks at him squarely. Not in joy, not in, in, in this wonderful, isn't everything great, but the Bible uses the word stern. Jesus looked at him, and in my mind, I just see Jesus with his finger saying, don't tell anyone. I mean, understand, this is so early in the ministry of Jesus that Jesus didn't want the sensational to get in the way of the foundational. He didn't want people so caught up in the miracle that they missed the message. 
So Jesus, when he talks to the, the man who's had the demon who's, who's been eradicated, when he talks, he, he tells him, be quiet. Don't tell anybody. It's not the right time right now. Let me get out there. Let me preach. Let me go ahead and share. Let me go ahead and let them know what the real message of the kingdom is. Don't tell anyone. And the man goes out and tells everyone. He goes out, and the Bible says that he spoke freely, without hindrance, without any kind of obstacle. Does anybody else find that just a bit ironic compared to what we tell each other today? Jesus says, don't tell them, and they goes out and tells everyone. And nowadays, the gospel is ours. And we're really good at being quiet about it. One of the disadvantage you have of having a pastor for a while, for a few years, is that his stories start to repeat themselves. With that in mind, <laughs> you're getting ready to hear a story again. Her name is Dorothy Watkins. She was a, a senior adult lady in my very first pastorate, Fairview, Oklahoma. It was a morning, uh, uh, fairly early in the morning. I was there getting ready for a funeral later that day, putting the final touches on the funeral sermon and, and not being very experienced in preaching funerals. At that point, I was uh, a little bit nervous about it, putting some, you know, a lot of time into it and and uh, trying to get things ready. And in the midst of that, my phone, uh, uh, my office phone buzzes the ladies in the kitchen have a question. See, they're in the kitchen now getting ready for the funeral dinner that's getting ready to happen. And in our, in our church, in our situation there, uh, we had just bought some new kitchen equipment, and part of that was a large commercial gas stove. I'm talking about and you know it, it, like eight 12 burners on it and all those it was great it was a wonderful little thing a little bit of money but the ladies loved it and i found out then ladies in the kitchen happy pastor happy okay just works really good that way well at some point once they turned it on and got it going they realized that uh, um, actually it's probably some of the men on the property committee realized that those little pilot lights on each one of those burners was consuming a considerable amount of gas that was equating to hundreds of thousands of dollars of the church budget from the way I heard it. I don't think it was quite that, but nonetheless. So they decided it would be best to go ahead and, make, and take the pilot lights out of the equation, and whenever they needed the stove, they would just light the burners manually with one of those clicker things, you know, one of those little lighter things. Well, they called my office that morning, midst of my study and said brother dave our clicker lighter thing doesn't work do you have a lighter yeah let me just pull my john 316 zippo out of my desk and bring it right down no i didn't have a lighter so i went down there because after all those poor ladies probably didn't know how to correctly operate the little clicker lighter thingy so I go down there to try and set things right, and I look at the lighter, and I go ahead and kind of shake it a little bit, and, you know, the, maybe it's out of fuel, out of butane for it. And, you know, I couldn't really tell. So, so the, the best way I learned in some class somewhere to find out if the lighter actually has butane in it is to hold it up to your ear and click it. And if you hear the butane coming out, then you know it's another different problem. This was in the day when Brother Dave used an awful lot of hairspray to get ready in the morning. And here comes Dorothy Watkins into the picture. She's standing over the sink, peeling carrots or potato, I don't know, something like that. She turns around and looks, and she says to me, after I perform this integral test into the quality of the butane lighter, she turns to me and says, Brother Dave, your hair's on fire. <laughs> I have thought back to that moment many times. And I am so glad that Dorothy was unhindered 
in letting me know my hair was on fire. She could have said, you know, I've never really told anybody their hair's on fire before. I don't really know how to do it. Or if I do say something, I might say the wrong thing. Or he might get offended if I tell him his hair's on fire. We probably need a committee to study how to tell people their hair is on fire, develop a class, and let everybody know the proper way to tell people that their hair is on fire. Fortunately, Dorothy didn't have any of those hindrances. Dorothy got to me in time and said, your hair's on fire. Brother Rusty, I guess they didn't get to you in time. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> That wasn't in the sermon until you made your little comment about long-haired music. Or, and all of a sudden, a new line went into the sermon notes. Folks, we know the hindrances that are before us. We know the things that are part of our life. And your church comes alongside you to try and help with that. Certainly so. We want folks to know how to share the gospel. We want to be able to provide opportunities and, and schedules that will make it possible to, uh, to, to plan on sharing your faith with somebody else. We make it part of a group thing. You can learn all the, uh, the little intricacies of how to do it, the ways to use Scripture. And, and we provide motivation and encouragement to be able to do that. And that is well and good. Nothing wrong with that. Everything right with that. Your evangelism ministry team is going to be doing even more of that for us as a congregation in days ahead. Yes, yes, yes. But the bottom line is, folks, it's not about a class. It's about simply telling someone what Jesus has done in your life. That man that went out, that leper that went out, even under the direct command of Jesus not to, he had to. Jesus had touched him. And the change was overwhelming, so much so that his very conversation had to be changed. He freely told everyone. Not because he'd been to the class, not because somebody preached a great sermon and he was motivated. Not because he just finally made up his mind to do it. He started talking about what Jesus had done. Because Jesus had touched him. And he just had to let people know that. Here's a quote. Evangelism training for an empty soul is akin to a driver's education class for someone with a car that's run out of gas. I wonder if my silence is more indicative of the condition of my heart than the people I'm talking to. I wonder if I'm not telling the story of Jesus because my story is old and outdated. And while there's been a time in my life when Jesus has touched me, maybe I need a fresh touch. Not a new salvation. Not, no, 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 no. But maybe I need to understand my relationship with Him needs work. Not my gospel presentation. Evangelism is more about Jesus touching my heart than it is about a sales pitch I share with everybody else. Evangelism. This leper decided that he was going to tell a story. Our student choir is going to come back up here to the stage right now. Everyone sing and share with us a song that talks about the story of Jesus. That talks about the fact that 
it's not just the Son of God out there. It's not just somebody I met. It's a Jesus who touched me. It's about my Jesus.